you very much. Um, and thank you for running the video. Um, wow, it's great to see such a large audience here. Thank you for coming out to hear my story. Uh, thank you for being here to learn more about the space program, which is a great investment that our country has in our future. Um, but I'm here today to tell you um, a story, to tell you my story. But I'd like to begin with, um, I live in Houston. Actually, I live halfway between the city of Houston and the city of Galveston. And if you remember back on September 13th, there was this terrible hurricane that went through the area, and it pretty much devastated uh, the Galveston and even parts of Houston. But it reminded me of a story that I used to tell my students when I taught at the Air Force Academy. And it's a story, it's fictional, which you'll probably figure out, but it's a story about opportunities. So it goes something like this. There was a flood coming into this town, and the waters in the river were rising. And this gentleman was living in his house, and he didn't want to leave. And the city decided they had to evacuate, so they come through with their fire trucks, and they bang on his door, and they said, hey, mister, get in the truck. We're here to save you. The floodwaters are coming. And he looked out his door, and he said, no, no, no. I'm going to stay. God will save me. And they said, well, we can't argue with that, so off they went. Well, the floodwaters continue to rise, and now the first floor of his house is flooded, and he's up on the second floor looking out the window, and a boat comes by with the rescue forces. And they said, hey, mister, get in the boat. We're here to save you. And he, the man said, no, 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 I'm not leaving. God will save me. And so the rescue people said, well, we can't argue with that, so off they went. And then, of course, the floodwaters continue to rise, and his second floor of his home was flooded, so he's up on the roof of the house, and down comes the helicopter, and the rescue forces yelled out, Hey, mister, get in the helicopter. We're here to save you. And the man said, I'm going to stay here. God will save me. And they said, Well, we can argue with that, and off they flew. So sure enough, the waters kept rising. The house got flooded. The man got whisked away, and he died. And he went to heaven, and he met his maker. And, and God said to him, do you have anything to say for yourself? He said, yes, I do. God, why didn't you save me? And God said, what are you talking about? I sent you a fire truck, a boat, and a helicopter, and you wouldn't get in any of them. So, you know, it's, I know some of you may have heard the story. It's an older story, but... I like to tell that because it, it's a story about opportunities. And you go through life, and opportunities can be there looking at you right in the face. And don't miss the opportunities. Be on the lookout for them. And I think that was kind of the story of my life. It's a story of opportunities. Um, I grew up in a small town, Elmira, New York. Our family was lower middle class. You know, we had had some hard times. We had been on food stamps. We had been on welfare. We spent six years in government subsidized housing. I remember I was a very shy child. In fact, when I was in second grade, my mother sent me to speech classes because I stuttered. I stuttered so bad. I, I was, uh, I'm not sure why, but here I am speaking to you today. So, you know, you can pretty much overcome anything. And I'm not sure how I grew out of that, but I did. And I went on to, uh, let me back up for a minute. My mother would take us to the library, and that's where I think I learned about flying. They could never afford to give me flying lessons, but I would read books about flying, about pilots of all, all types of pilots, military, men, women, uh, civilian pilots. When I went to summer camp, I'd watch the gliders fly overhead, and that was what I wanted to do someday. So I learned about my career through books. Um, my parents could not afford to send me to any expensive camps or anything like that. But I, when I was 16, I started uh, part-time jobs. I worked at a putt-putt golf course. I worked at my church. I worked at a restaurant, uh, catalog showroom, hospital. And I saved up $1,000 by the time, which was a lot back in those days. By the time I was 19, I went and signed up for flying lessons. And I learned how to fly, and I joined the Air Force. And this is where the story kind of gets interesting because... Back in 1978, the Air Force had just started taking women into pilot training. And in fact, the base that I attended, Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma, had their first class of women. There were four of us, and I was one of those four. 
So people didn't really know what to do with us. They looked at us like we were Martians in our green flight suits. My first day on the base, I'm going to tell you a couple stories about being a woman pilot, and I'll just tell you a couple and then we'll be done. Um, they weren't used to seeing women in flight suits. And I was new on the base, I had to do my grocery shopping, so I went into the commissary and at the checkout counter, the lady who checked me out at the cash register said, you know, the wives don't want you here. I said, really? She said, can you tell me why? And she said, well, they don't want you going cross country with their husbands. I said, oh, well, thank you for telling me that. And I'm glad she did because, you know, in my mind, I was there to fly. I wanted to learn how to fly, and that was the only reason I was there. But I realized it was important for me to get to know everybody so they knew who we were. So our first class party, most of the men in my class, by the way, were recently married and went to the first class party. I was the only single gal there. And I walked in, and all the, this is very traditional, all the men were over here, the students and instructors talking about the airplanes and how you do the spin recovery and how you do acrobatics and how you do procedures and what the simulators are like. And they're all over here talking. That was what I wanted to hear. But the wives were over here talking about, you know, hey, we're living in Enid, and they're talking about their friends and a lot of things that I, I really didn't know about because I, they, they seemed to know each other. But I said, you know, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to get to know the wives. And you know what? Many of them are still friends of mine today. So the culture was, was very different back then. And the women who first got into the military and first got into flying, as strange as it was, times are different nowadays. And women can join the military and, and fit in a lot better. I went on to fly C-141s, and then I went to teach at the Air Force Academy. I went to test pilot school. Um, even at the Air Force test pilot school, um, when I first met the Commandant, I was walking down the hall, and he knew I was going to be the class leader because I was the senior ranking officer. And the first thing he said to me was, Major Collins, is your husband going to run the wives club? <laughs> I said, and I, well, sir, yes, he will. I'll, I'll, I'll tell him. So I went home, <laughs> I told my husband, Pat, I said, Pat, uh, the Commandant wants you to run the wives club. And he said, I'm, I will do that. He said, all of our meetings are going to be on the golf course. <laughs> and, and they were, and, and he enjoyed that. And we've had a, we've had a lot of fun times. Um, so enough of the stories. Um, I, I think in the end I can say that for the first women that went through pilot training, what the, or went, just flew in the military, I think the key was to focus on the mission, forget all the extraneous things, just focus on the mission, really love the mission, study it, believe in it, and have a sense of humor. And I think those, and I did have a sense of humor because if you took all the jokes seriously, I think you'd be, you'd be a little bit unhappy. So we, we had fun, and there's a lot more stories where they uh, come from. But I think really my love of flying is what got me through all that, and my love of flying is what really made the difference. So I'd like to fast forward to space flight. I was 33 years old when I applied to the NASA uh, astronaut program. We did the interview. Um, if you have questions later, I'm happy to talk about the interview process and the training. But it, it, it lasts about six days, the astronaut interview. It's very uh, thorough. There's a lot of medical testing. Um, there's an interview, and there's a lot of social things that you uh, have to do. And then about two months later, you get the call. Either you're in or you're not. And I was um, very happy. It was uh, 1990 that my dream, since fourth grade, my dream came true, and NASA invited me to Johnson Space Center for astronaut training, which lasted one year. And at the end of that one-year period, uh, the astronauts go into different jobs. Now, in the, oh, it's been, I think, 18 years uh, since I have uh, been an astronaut. I've flown four missions. Um, in between missions, the astronauts do jobs. Uh, the ones I did were uh, Mission Control, Capcom. I worked as a launch support person at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, orbiter engineering support, safety. There's many, many jobs that the astronauts do in between missions. And, and we work with the engineers and the flight controllers and the flight directors and people throughout the space agency that do a fantastic job. I'm going to go back to 
2003. We were on a roll, the space program was doing well, flying space shuttles to the space station, we were building the space station, we were working well with the Russians. I was getting ready to fly my last flight in March of 2003. And we were only five weeks from launch when we lost Columbia. And that was on February 1st of 2003. That accident, as tragic as it was, um, we, we lost our first shuttle to ever fly in space, Columbia, and we lost seven of our friends. And as tragic as that was, the, the huge loss that was for the space program, there were so many lessons learned that came out of that accident. I'd like to share a couple of them with you as we lead into my last flight, which was the return to flight mission in the summer of 2005. And I will show you a video about that in a few minutes. But the Columbia exit, if you remember, it was a Saturday morning, and Columbia had done their deorbit burn, and they were safely coming home. And we were surprised when the astronauts stopped returning the radio calls. We thought, well, they lost their communication. Well, it'll, it'll come back. But then when the radar controllers at Kennedy Space Center said that they did not have a radar return, I knew something was terribly wrong because the shuttle, once it does its deorbit burn, it is always where it is supposed to be to the second, and it wasn't there. I had been uh, watching NASA TV at the time, and I started changing channels, and someone had sent in a video of the debris burning across the Texas sky. And the thought that went through my mind was, at the time, it was strange, was, I know spaceflight is risky, and I'm surprised we've gone this long since Challenger without an accident. It was just very, very tragic. The first thing we had to do was take care of our families and take care of our workers because people were hurting very bad. It took nine months to figure out what caused the accident because it was so subtle. A piece of foam had fallen off the fuel tank, insulating foam, and hit the shuttle's thermal protection system and put a hole in the wing. And we didn't know that hole was there. When Columbia came home, the, you know, we heat up to over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That heat got into the wing and melted the wing off. That's what caused the accident. And all the things that we had studied and learned and practiced, and NASA does a very, very good job at this, of leadership, teamwork, uh, working together, things like knowing your job very, very well, studying it. Secondly, working well with people and communicating well. And thirdly, integrity in all the things that we do, um, making decisions, and we know why we made these decisions because they're in the best interest of the mission. All of these things were things that NASA had done very well. But if you study the causes of the accident, some of the things we could have done better, I think, I think we could have been a little more humble in the way we look at our systems because people thought, ah, this shuttle, this, this thermal protection system is indestructible. There is nothing that can break this thermal protection system, and there was. We needed to be a little more humble in the way we see this. I think we also needed to be a little more creative in the way we look at things. And I think day to day, we can be a little more creative in our thinking. And when we're assigned a job to be innovative, which we were after the accident, we can be better at that too. One of the things you'll see in the movie that I show is an engineer who was very creative came up with the idea of flipping the shuttle around as we rejoin with the space station. Flip the shuttle around and the space station crew can photograph our tiles and see if there's any damage. And I'm, I'm surprised that we hadn't thought of that before, but it was a very simple, cheap, elegant way and fun thing that we can do as we rejoin with the space station. And we were able, actually, we flew that maneuver for the first time on my mission and in the photographs, the engineers saw two, they're like little pieces of cardboard called gap fillers that had popped out between the tiles, and they saw those that could cause some issues, heating issues on re-entry, and we removed those on our mission. And again, you'll see that during a spacewalk that we did. And another thing that I think we learned is to be, better, be a better listener. And it's easy, you're sitting there now listening to me, that's passive listening, but one of the things we try to do is be active listeners and go out to the factories and go out to the engineers and go out to the workers in the space program and say, 
Tell us what you're thinking. Tell us what do you like, what do you don't like, what can we do better? And so I think these are all things that we had learned from the accident. It was two and a half years by the time my mission eventually flew. And there were many changes that were made. And I think the space shuttle is a lot safer than it was back in, back in 2003, but it's still not 100% safe. Every time we launch a shuttle, we're still taking risk. Although every mission, we continue to get safer. And because of that, the shuttle will only fly 10 more missions. We're going to stop flying the shuttle because we're designing a safer launch vehicle. And I'll show you that also. So the mission eventually flew in July of 2005. I'm going to show you a video in about one minute, uh, but just a little bit of background on, on the mission. There were two, two people on the space station when we launched. One Russian, we call the Russians cosmonauts, and that was Sergei Krikalov, and he was the commander at the time. And the other was John Phillips, who was the science officer. And the way we work our space station crews is we alternate the commander between the Russian and the American. Now we have three crew members on the space station, and starting next spring, we'll have six crew members on the space station. But when my crew went up there, um, Sergey and John uh, met us, and you'll, again, you'll see that in the video, and we carried on uh, three spacewalks, and we transferred 5,000, we took up 5,000 pounds of logistics and science experiments, and we brought back 6,000 pounds. So let's go ahead and uh, start the movie. I'm going to narrate this, and this is a movie that my crew put together. Let's come over here. My crew was uh, made up of, uh, my pilot was Jim Kelly, who was an Air Force test pilot. He flew F-15s in the Air Force. Uh, Wendy Lawrence was from the Navy, um, Navy captain. She was in charge of our logistical transfer. Um, Andy Thomas uh, from Australia, an aerospace engineer. And Steve Robinson, uh, an American, who is also an aerospace engineer. Okay, there's Jim in the front. Oh, Soichi was our Japanese astronaut. He also has a degree in aerospace engineering. And finally, Charlie Camarda, who's a, a materials engineer. Okay, and July 13th, we came out to the launch pad, strapped in. Three hours later, we launch. By the way, but when we clear the tower, we're going over 100 miles per hour and you are hauling going up there. You're accelerating at three Gs, which is three times your normal weight in acceleration. You can see the view from the camera. If you can see my uh, laser pointer, this is the beach, and there's the launch pad below us. This is a camera on the solid rocket boosters looking at the external tank. Two and a half, about two minutes or so, the boosters separate and they fall back. And the cameras here are to look for debris similar to what happened on Columbia to see if there's any foam that falls off that might hit the shuttle. Here's another view. We're up to eight and a half minutes. Main engine cut off. The shuttle goes up and the external tank comes down. And over the next uh, two days, we fire the engines and we do a series of what we call burns to rejoin with the International Space Station. And you can see when we do these burns, when we fire our jets, there we go, we join with the space station. Now, this is a view from the space station looking down at the shuttle. And here's where they photographed our tiles that had those gap fillers protruding. This is sped up a little bit. It actually went slower than this. In the next view, you're going to see, OK, this is what we saw from the shuttle looking at the station. OK, these are the station's uh, solar arrays that are used for, uh, to give us power. This is the living quarters. It's about the size of six school buses end to end. Here we're doing, the, we're doing the docking. You can see the space station over the top of my head. We dock at 0.2 feet per second. It's very, very slow. We equalize the pressure between the shuttle and the station, and then we open the hatches. Now, this is Sergei, our, the Russian commander on the other side. They had been up there for several months, and and the space station had not been visited by a shuttle in two and a half years. They were very happy to see us. <laughs> and OK, there's, there's Sergey on the left, John on the right in the light blue, and my crew's coming in. There's Wendy. Uh, the previous was Andy. OK, there's Jim. 
it was pretty neat for us to get on the space station because we had studied it and, and we had finally got a chance to see what the insides look like. Uh, you see John's holding that bag there. We thought they were happy to see us, but really they wanted their coffee. And that's what John has. He's not going to let go of that bag of coffee. We started doing this transfer. The Andy in the foreground here is um, bringing, really, it's just logistics, science experiments, food, clothing, just real necessities for them to run their mission. That was the fourth day. Now we're up to the fifth day. Um, Soichi's in the middle there getting ready for the spacewalks. They, they did spacewalks on day five, seven, and nine. During the spacewalk, Wendy and Jim ran the robot arm, and you run the robot arm with these laptop computers, and the camera's images is projected on the computer. You can't actually see the robot arm when you fly it. You have to look at your laptop computer to see what you're doing. And you have to be able to do that translation in your mind. So here, Soichi and Steve start their spacewalk. They're going out of the shuttle airlock, and it, it takes them about five hours in the morning to get all their equipment out, to get into their suit, to do a pressure check, and then to get out the hatch. And then they spend about six and a half hours on the spacewalk itself. Here's uh, Soichi at the airlock getting his equipment, and here he is on the end of the robot arm. It's kind of hard to see it in this picture, but this is the robot arm where my laser pointer is, and Here's Soichi flying up to the space station. Now, the first spacewalk, they tested some techniques on how to repair damage in space, and that's, been, that's met with relative success. The second spacewalk was to change out a gyroscope on the space station. Now, these gyroscopes, which you'll see here in a minute, and there's Soichi waving at us. The gyroscopes, there's four of them that, hold, that control the attitude of the space station. They're about this big, about the, the length of your arm span, and on Earth, they weigh 600 pounds, but in space, they're weightless. So you can hold one of these, a mass of 600 pounds in space, and there it is, this big black device, and here's Soichi holding it. He held that for 45 minutes while he was flown from the shuttle up to the space station. And here he is again. This is the gyroscope, and here's Soichi, and here's the robot arm. So Wendy flew him from the shuttle up to the station. They took out the old one, put in the new one, and then he, f he flew the old, the broken one, back to the shuttle. On the third spacewalk, this is Steve. Right here, he's removing that gap filler that was, that was seen in the photographs from the rendezvous. Here's his right hand, and here's this, it's like a piece of cardboard or a hard piece of fabric that had popped out, and you'll see the red, the red is the glue that failed. And you don't want to have these, these protrusions because it'll disturb the airflow on entry. And you, you, you come home at 25 times the speed of sound. You don't want to have any protrusions, so we had to remove those. And now the engineers have come up with a method to keep these from popping out in the future. And there's our three spacewalk crew members. They're downlinking the video to the engineers. So we had a very successful mission. On flight day 11, we said goodbye to the space station crew. They were ready to get rid of us because we completely turned their house upside down. But they were happy that we brought them a lot of work and they were ready to, to get back to work. We did this fly around to the space station. Here's, again, the solar arrays that provide our energy. Here's the living quarters. This is the Russian side down here. These are radiators, which are used for cooling. The space station doesn't look like this anymore. It's gotten much bigger. It's about twice the size now than when my crew flew back in 2005. Uh, there's Charlie in the background with the laser. We use lasers to give us our distance and our uh, closure rate and opening rate on the space station. We did another series of burns. and these got, Anything that's not strapped down is going to hit the wall. And these guys are, of course, clowning around. They, I put this in the movie because I wanted my kids to see how you sleep in space. That's a sleeping bag. You just float it around while you sleep. Uh, here's our return. Uh, we're coming home. You can see the pink in the windows. Again, we're heating up outside. This plasma develops around the shuttle. Uh, this infrared view from the ground shows how hot we get as we return home. We landed in California. Uh, there, you can see how hot the nose is. Coming down the glide slope, 
we're about seven times steeper than a commercial flight would be, and we land about twice as fast. This is the runway at Edwards Air Force Base. It's about three miles long. Uh, we use a drag chute to help us slow down and stabilize us on the runway. And here we land, we landed just before sunrise. And we were very, very happy to get this mission back. We had actually felt like we were, we were completing the Columbia cruise mission, which is to explore space. We were completing it, but yet we were carrying it out. And that was a huge sense of relief for us. And when we got out of the shuttle, the, the workers from Kennedy Space Center that came down to recover us from the flight, they had tears in their eyes. And they have, I mean, so much of their life is in the space program, and they so much believe in, in what we do. Um, it, it actually was very overwhelming for me as I walked out of the shuttle, just having this whole mission behind me. But the other thing that happens to astronauts when you come home from space, in our case, we've been up there for 15 days, and we got very used to being in zero gravity, and it was very comfortable to be floating around. And you come back from the mission, and all of a sudden, you're back in this gravity field again. And you feel like you weigh 500 pounds. It's hard. It's hard to get out of your seat. Actually, the doctors come in and help us get out of our seat. It's hard to get down the stairs, and when you see us walking off of the shuttle and coming down the stairs and shaking hands with people, you think we might be saying, hi, it's happy to be back home? No. We're saying, can you keep holding my hand so I don't fall over? <laughs> because the two things happen. You feel very, very heavy when you come back, and just taking that one step is you wonder, what is this strange force holding my feet on the ground? Why are my feet stuck to the ground? And the other thing that's happening to you is you're off balance. And if you put your head back to look at the tiles under the shuttle, you could very well just fall over. And astronauts have done that. So we have to be very careful with our balance. And the, the issue that we're concerned about is if we ever had to you know, run away from the shuttle in the event of an emergency, that would be very difficult for us to do. So we have a lot of countermeasures, uh, which I can talk about later if you have questions, but one of the things that we do is we drink salt water before we come home, based on your body weight. So I would have to drink 32 ounces of salt water, or you could take salt tablets and drink water, and that way your body will retain the water so you won't get this uh, lightheaded feeling that can make you faint. So those are some of the changes that we go through when we come back and it's a whole area of study. Part of the reason, in fact, the main reason that we have a space station is to study the human body and the changes we go through when we go up to space and the changes we go through when we come back. By adding the variable of zero gravity and the radiation that we receive, we're able to study the human body in ways that we can't on Earth. So that's the purpose of the space station, is we plan to someday go back to the moon and onto Mars. So that's I'd say a point of view from the mission. I'd also like to show you some of the things that we do in space that are really fun, and that's looking back at the Earth. And that's what I enjoy the most. Um, I enjoy learning about the Earth um, from the point of view of the environment, from the point of view of geography, geology, history. There's so many things, and you see places that you'd like to travel to someday. So let's go to the next uh, um, PowerPoint presentation, and I promise you I have no words on my slides, <laughs> except for I think the word NASA might be up there. But what I want to show you is some pictures and some of the neat things that my crew saw on the missions that I flew. So most of these pictures were taken uh, from uh, my crew members on the missions that I've flown. So let's uh, go to the next one. This was taken on August 1st of 2005 by Soichi. These are the Southern Lights, and they're called the Aurora Australis. And Suichi didn't want to take this picture. He said it wouldn't come out, but it actually did. And these, you can see the, this is the, the South Pole is down here somewhere, but this is the bottom of the Earth. You can see the stars. But this greenish looking blob is there because the solar radiation, when the sun is very active, that solar radiation will interact with the Earth's magnetic field, and it gives you these beautiful lights. And we were flying through these for days. And I was a little concerned that my crew might be getting too much radiation, so I called Houston and asked them, what's going on with the sun? And they said that on a scale of one to nine, the sun was at a seven. 
and it was putting out a lot of solar radiation. One, which brings a point to surfaces. The number one concern we have for the health of astronauts in space is getting too much radiation, which you can get from the sun or from cosmic background radiation. And we're looking for ways to protect our astronauts so they aren't exposed to, for example, increased cancer risk or who knows what else the additional radiation uh, can do to us. But a beautiful light show. Next. This is Florida. You can see the peninsula right here. And here's the Bahamas. I'd like to show this photograph for two reasons. One of them is the orbit that we're in is not that high. I mean, we're, we don't see the Earth as a little dot like the Apollo astronauts did when they went to the moon. We are actually only about 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. So imagine yourself driving down the road 250 miles. And let's say you're on the highway, so that might take about f four hours maybe. So if you could drive for four hours, take that distance and go up with it, that's how high we are. We're not up that high. But if you think about airplanes, fly at about maybe six or seven miles, you can breathe up to about three miles. Technically, you're in space at about 50 miles. In fact, when you go over 50 miles, you get your astronaut wings. And, and you're in, you can see the stars at noon from 50 miles. So we're up at about 250 miles, which, which isn't that high. So we go around the Earth once every 90 minutes, which means every 45 minutes, you get a sunrise, and then 45 minutes later, a sunset. And then 45 minutes later, a sunrise, and 45 minutes later, a sunset. And it goes on like that all day long and all night long. And it really can mess with your circadian rhythm. So we, we use our watches to keep track of where we are in the day. And our meals will keep track of where we are in the day. And then at night, we just close all the, we pull all the shades so it's dark all the time. And the other thing I want to show you on this is the atmosphere. You can't really see the atmosphere up here because it is, like I mentioned earlier, the breathable air goes up to about three miles. The atmosphere on the Earth is like, I've heard it described as an apple skin on an apple. That's how thin it is. And the clouds are, I mean, the, all of them, they're just very, very low, which drives on the point that our atmosphere really isn't that big, and we all share the same air. Next. This is Hurricane Rita, which if you remember Katrina that went through New Orleans back in August of 05, Rita went through Houston, well, went just north of Houston about three weeks later. John Phillips took this picture from the space station, and uh, you, you've all seen pictures of hurricanes from space. They all kind of look the same, um, very menacing, very dangerous. But if you think about what was going through John's mind when he took this picture, this hurricane was going straight at Houston. Fortunately, it took a little turn at the last minute. And John's family evacuated, along with the entire city of Houston evacuated. But the astronauts in space worry about their families for a lot of reasons. Um, during 9-11, uh, back in 2001, we had two astronauts on the space station. And it's important for us to take care of our astronauts because they feel very isolated and unable to help, especially if their families might be in danger. Some of the things that we do to help the astronauts in space cope with issues back on Earth they get the news, they get uh, internet access, they have video cameras where they can actually get video uh, with their families in their living rooms at home. They also have a telephone, and they, if, if they had your cell phone number, they could call you right now. So there's no limits on them calling down. Um, there are limits calling up. <laughs> only certain uh, emails can go up for obvious reasons, and only certain phone uh, mails can go up because they go through a filter. But we really try uh, to keep, you know, send movies and, and kind of just the human side of being in space to take care of it from that point of view because someday we'll have astronauts traveling to Mars and they're going to be gone for many, many years. And we're trying to see what things work for being away from home for long periods of time. This is Melville Island. It's an island north of Australia. In itself, it's not that important, but I wanted to show this because of the fires. Um, over the equator, at almost any point in time, when an astronaut looks out the window, you're going to see forests burning 
around the equator. It, it's what the people do. They clear land for either development or for agriculture or for whatever reason. This is happening and there's deforestation taking place and not a lot we can do about it because they own the land and they can do what they want with it. But we try to take data on it, just the facts. But I want to tell you a story. I, it actually wasn't this photograph, but it was Africa. I saw hundreds of fires in Africa on my last flight, so I called Houston and I said, I want to report, I am seeing, and I was counting them, all these fires in Africa. And I just made the call and I took some pictures. When I got home, my husband told me that he had been listening to a radio talk show <laughs> and someone called in and said, why is that woman astronaut pushing her environmental agenda from space? <laughs> I said, wait a minute, I'm not doing that, I'm just reporting what I see. So we have to be very careful what we say because people try to read into what, what we're saying. Our job is to report what we see and not to make any opinion on it. And we, we try not to do that. Next. I thought that was, just was a funny story. Um, on my third flight, we did a study of coral reefs. And this little island is a, it's an atoll in the, uh, I think this was in the, uh, near the Azores, in the, uh, mid-Atlantic Ocean. What, what scientists are doing is studying the coral reefs to determine what the health of the oceans, to determine the health of the oceans, and they can do that from the surface as well as from space. So we take photographs for them, and there's so many of these like little jewels all around the planet. They're just beautiful. I forgot the name of this one. I, my crew members called it Pork Chop Island, because we like to show that in our, in our, um, uh, post-flight videos. Uh, this is the Betsy Boca River Delta, which is in Madagascar, which is this big island to the southeast of Africa. The island has been almost totally deforested since the 1970s. You can compare pictures from the Apollo, uh, the, uh, Apollo Skylab project with the shuttle pictures, and you can see how not only is there deforestation, but these rivers are normally blue, like you see at the top up here. But when they're this brown color, that means there's erosion taking place. So again, we document that from space. This is in Canada. Uh, it is a impact crater, the Manicougan crater, up in northern Canada. And it's, it's been you know hundreds of thousands of years since the Earth was hit with this uh, asteroid. But the the scar is still there because the land is not eroded. It's pretty, pretty well frozen. You can see the, the snow and the ice. I like to show this because one of the concerns that some scientists have in this planet is the threat of asteroids or comets that may hit the planet. We know it's happened in the past. There was one that scientists believe exterminated the uh, dinosaurs many millions of years ago. And the Air Force tracks all of these what we call near-Earth objects. If any of them ever get close enough to hit us, which you know, may not happen for you know, tens of thousands of years, but it may happen in 10 years, we don't know. So scientists are looking for ways to deflect astro uh, asteroids that may be coming towards the Earth. You can't blow them up. We just don't have the power to do that. But we think we may have the ability to divert the course so they wouldn't come close to Earth. And we're all, we are quite often changing the, the uh, space shuttle or the space station's orbits to avoid getting hit by smaller objects. Now we've got some fun slides just to, to finish this out. Some neat places on the Earth that you may have, uh, that you did, you did learn about in school or that you may want to visit someday. This is the Himalaya Mountains. On the, we're looking west. On the left is India. On the right is uh, Taklamakan uh, Plateau of China, and somewhere in here is, the, is uh, Mount Everest. Next. Another famous part of the planet, we're looking west, north is up here at the top, and this is the Mediterranean Sea, and this is the Nile Delta and the Nile River coming down here. Then the Red Sea, oops, go back. We've got the Gulf of Suez, the Gulf of Aqaba, and this is the Sinai Peninsula. I really love looking at the Middle East from space because it's always clear, 
You've got this beautiful blue water, the bright tan desert, and then the black sky. It's just a, in, and when you think about the history that took place in that part of our planet, it's just a beautiful place to look at. On the next slide, same area, but a close-up view. A lot of these photographs that you'll see coming up, we took with a uh, long lens, so we were able to zoom in a little bit closer. Does anybody recognize this area? Want to take a guess? Somebody said it, the dead, the, correct, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is down here at the bottom, but up at the top is this, um, this is Israel. The, this is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea at the bottom. The Dead Sea has, the water levels in the Dead Sea have gone down quite a bit in the several decades. Jerusalem is this gray area right here. If, if you go from the north part of the Dead Sea uh, straight west, there's Jerusalem. And then astronauts have said in the past that you, when you're up in space, you can't see borders between countries. Well, in this case, you can. Uh, this, if, for those of you that can see the bottom here, this is the border between Israel and Egypt. And they, we actually traveled to Israel after our mission. They told, we asked about this, and they said there's a difference in the grazing patterns and the agriculture patterns between the two countries, and that's why you can see the border. Next. Same area of the planet. We zoomed in on this one. I wanted to just make the point that when you see anything straight from space, it's man-made. And this is the Suez Canal. Next. Uh, does anybody want to guess what this is? It's, I'll give you a hint. It's part of the United States, but it's an island. Somebody knows there's stuff over there. This is Oahu. Um, north is over here on the right. And this is Pearl Harbor. And down here, this little dot is Diamond Head. And there's uh, the beach. It's really hard to get a picture of Hawaii totally clear. There's all, it seems like it's always cloudy on the east sides of the island. Next. A close-up view. Uh, we zoomed in on this famous city in the United States. New York, very good. Um, I think some interesting things you can see in here. Of course, the Hudson River, and this is Long Island. Long Island, you can call it. In Manhattan, you can see Central Park, and there's snow on the ground. And Central Park will show. And this down here is the Statue of Liberty. In, of course, New Jersey, <laughs> where I was born. <laughs> Next. I know you know this area. It's, it looks a little confusing because you're looking southwest. Right, it's the Great Lakes. This is Superior, Michigan, there's us right there. Huron, Erie, and Ontario, and Detroit is right in here and Niagara Falls down at the bottom. It seemed like on this particular mission, every afternoon at three o'clock we took a break, we looked out the window and there it was. <laughs> August, beautiful blue skies um, for you, for us. Black skies, but a beautiful earth. The, the other thing that's interesting about being an astronaut, you know, you, you study maps your whole life with north at the top. When you look out the window, that's all, it, it's always confusing because north is never at the top, it seems, because north doesn't mean anything when you're in space. Next. You've got to be able to look at things from a different perspective. Okay, somebody said it, Massachusetts. This is Boston and Boston Harbor, Cape Cod. And we have Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Island, and there's Rhode Island. A lot of history took place down in these areas. Next. These are just fun pictures. Um, this one is a little bit harder to guess. It's looking east. Let's go, to the, let, let's go to the next one because it's the same area, looking back in the other direction. Does anybody want to guess what that is? Somebody got it? Greece? It's Greece. Very good. This, this is um, west. Okay, north is over here. And Greece, here's Athens in here in, the, in Sparta. Do you remember in school you learned about the um, Athens was a naval power and Sparta was a land power and they would, they would fight each other. And the Greeks would come out here in the Aegean Sea and they would explore all of these islands. This is Turkey down at the bottom, by the way. I like to study Greek history, and I, th there's a lot of parallels there. The Greeks were people that explored. They'd get in their boats. They went out. Heck, I bet a lot of them didn't make it back, but they explored because they were curious, just like we are today. We go out into space because we're curious. 
we don't really know what we're going to find, but we explore because that's the kind of people we are. We're curious people. And this last one here is just kind of a fun picture. I think most of you can probably pick this one out. Again, we zoomed in. This is north over here. It's Italy. There's the heel. There's the foot. And Rome is over here. And Naples is in here, Mount Vesuvius. Which sometimes you, the volcanoes, you can see smoke coming out of volcanoes in some parts of the world. So those are just some neat pictures of the Earth. I, I really have loved studying the Earth from space. Um, what I'd like to do now is transition uh, to the next. We'll keep going through the slides here. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going to happen in the next 10 years or so. The space shuttle is only going to fly another 10 missions, which we hope to do over the next two, two and a half years. And our goal is to stop flying the space shuttle after 2010. The space shuttle will be replaced by a new launch vehicle, which NASA is already building and testing. In fact, this rocket will be tested next, the first flight will be tested next summer. It's called the Ares-1 rocket. It's got a version of a, a space shuttle solid rocket booster down here. Here's the second stage, and all up here at the top is where the crew sits. This is called the Orion spacecraft. And this little tower here with these jets is the escape system. One of the benefits of flying this, it looks a lot like the Apollo uh, Saturn V, but even though it looks like that, it is it is different because it's got newer and safer technology in it. The space shuttle, if you remember the Challenger accident, the astronauts had no way to get out. They don't have an ejection seat. But in this, in this spacecraft, if there's an explosion on the ascent, the crew has a way to eject themselves, or the, actually the ground can eject them by firing these rockets up here, pulling the crew off the top, and they can safely splash down in the event of some explosion or a loss of control. So in that sense, it'll be, it'll be a safer uh, spacecraft to fly. The Orion up here will be able to take six people to the space station beginning, we hope, in 2015. And then we can go to the next slide. That same spacecraft in the future will be able to take up to four people to the surface of the moon. And the crew will join up in low Earth orbit with the lunar lander, which will be launched on a different rocket. They will do their TLI burn, or their translunar injection burn, head over to the moon, which takes three days, go into orbit around the moon, land all four astronauts on the surface. And our goal in going back to the moon, we can go to the next slide, our goal in going back to the moon is not just to collect rocks and explore it and come home and declare victory and quit like we, like we did during Apollo, but our goal would be to stay there for periods of time and build research stations on the moon and, and use the minerals on the moon for things back here at Earth. For example, the helium-3 that's plentiful on the moon can be used as a source of energy back here on Earth. And there have been books written on how you can do this. Let's go to the next slide. It's just a depiction of what the Altair lander will look like when we get back to the moon, hopefully in around the 2020 time period. And I should mention that China is, has set ambitions of landing on the moon. And also, we've heard from Russia and India that they would like to not only launching robotic missions to the moon, but they'd like to send people to the moon someday. We can uh, go to the last slide. Um, but we have all signed, most of the countries, vast majority of the countries on our planet have signed the Outer Space Treaty that says no nation will claim any part of the moon or any part of any celestial body as its own. So we can't go to the moon and say, we own it. It's ours by treaty. And no one's going to do that, we hope. <laughs> but commercial companies can do that. They can go to the moon and they can mine and they can say, we're going to bring this product back to the Earth and we can make a profit off of it. And we want companies to do that because we want to be able to use these resources to make life better back here on Earth. Now, I think that's the end of our slides. I just want to uh, make a conclusion here, and maybe we'll have some time for some questions. But we're going to be facing change in the space program. Change is hard. People don't want to see the shuttle go away. I mean, the shuttle has been a fantastic flying machine. It's been very successful. Despite the problems that we have, I think it'll, be, it'll go down in history as being a, 
a very strong part of our space history. But we've got to change. It's time. It, I remember um, somebody told me a long time ago, and I, I wrote this down because I like this quote, a person's age can be determined by the amount of pain one feels when encountering a new idea. And, you know, I hope that's not me. You know, I, we always hear that, oh, you know, we need to get young people in here because they have all the new ideas. But I think that, you know, people have been around a while, too. If you can just keep yourself from getting stuck in a rut, change is good for us. And I, I don't want to sound like a politician. I'm sorry if I do. But this is, this is something that I learned as an astronaut, that if we're going to progress, we have to be able to welcome new opportunities. So today, I have talked about opportunities. That's how I started. I've talked about overcoming adversity and, and some tough times, having a sense of humor, getting around those things, the importance of always focusing on the mission and the mission being number one, despite all these distractions that happen in your life, what's important in leadership qualities and the nature of spaceflight. Spaceflight is fun. I mean, we, it's an investment in the future, but it really, it really is a lot of fun. And I'm hoping that someday, I know someday more people will be able to fly in space. And then our children and children's children will have more opportunities to do that. And to conclude, you know, I read a lot on space history. And Robert Goddard is a person who's known in the United States as the father of modern rocketry. And he once said, the dreams of yesterday are the realities of today in the hopes for a better tomorrow. So thank you very much for being with me tonight. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, my question is, uh, you said that the shuttle was going to end in 2010, and the Orion? Yes. Is going to start right. in 2015. Oh, okay. That's a five-year gap. <laughs> That's what about right. the people on the space station in those five years? And is okay, there, her, is, did, did everybody hear her question in the back? Yeah. Um, you, you hit on, on the number one issue that we're dealing with right now, um, which we call the gap in human space flight. Um, our, country's leadership, which is our Congress and our President, have decided we have to stop flying the space shuttle. And that's based on the accident that we had and the, and the risks that we take in flying the space shuttle. We stop at the end of 2010, but this, we don't have enough money to get this new Orion flying until 2015. So in that five-year time period, we will pay the Russians to launch our astronauts on the Soyuz rocket. We have a contract with them. They're we have a very good history with them. We get along very well with the Russians. At our level, we get along very well. Um, when they invaded Georgia a couple months ago, there was a lot of red flags that went up and, ooh, are we taking a risk? Um, yeah, yeah, there is a risk that, you know, we have to stay, you know, an international relations level. We need to stay in good relations with Russia to keep this program going. So the Russians helped us after the Columbia accident, and they're going to help us get through this gap. So that's where we are, and there's not a whole lot we can do now. We do have a program where some smaller commercial companies are figuring out how to launch their rockets to get cargo to the space station. But to get humans there, it's so much more complicated to get humans there. You need to design safety systems. You need environmental systems so we can breathe air. We need uh, food. We need to handle waste products. And you need to get people back, so you need to have a heat shield. So it's much more difficult to get people up and back. So we'll see how it goes. It's, it's going to be an interesting five years. Somebody back here had a question? question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, you can know if something is wrong with the spaceship when you're in space. How are you going to get, if, if it's really seriously wrong, how do you get people back to Earth then? OK, her question is, if there's a problem in the spacecraft, well, it's seriously wrong, how do you get people back? Shuttle. In the shuttle? Uh, well, if you have a serious problem in the shuttle, now we train for all kinds of emergencies and different levels of emergencies, so it depends on what happened. You, the, let's say you have a fire and smoke. You need to come home right away. We have a procedure. You, you put on the smoke mask, first of all, so you can continue to breathe and function. You get out the checklist, which you start turning off equipment to stop the, the fire. And then you slowly, then you have to clean the air out, and then you have to power things back up to come home. Now, the other problem, uh, serious problem, could be, I'm getting some feedback here, could be you get hit with some micrometeorite uh, or a little piece of space junk comes through a window and you start losing your air. 
another very serious problem. We trained for it. We got to get our suits on so we, we have our breathing air. And we have to start looking for places we can land and do a burn and come home. So we train in simulators for these over and over and over again. What happens if our radiators fail? What happens if we have a water leak? What happens if we lose our Freon? You have to memorize all this stuff. And astronauts even be able to need to reach for switches. You know, we practice these things. Blindfold yourself. Go float up to the panel and find the switches that you need without being able to see them. Many procedures we memorize because we don't have time to pull the checklist out. Boldface type procedures that you have to have committed to memory. So we train for years and years. And the key I had for many of these was just memorize it. I'm also a jogger, so when I go jogging and I swim, I would run these procedures through my head and I would put myself in situ like, what, what if? What if this happens? What if this happens? And I kind of work my way through it. What am I going to do with my crew? You know, pilot, you go figure out our emergency landing site. Uh, flight engineer, you go run the procedures on isolating the fire. And you just send your crew off to do different things. And then the commander's just got to keep track of where everybody is. So it's just, I think training is, is the answer to that. And you know, on the space station Mir in 1997, there was a fire on that space station. We almost lost everybody. The smoke completely filled up the space station in seconds. And the cosmonauts and the astronauts had to find their smoke masks with their eyes closed. And then about three months later, they had a collision and they started losing air. And there's two very, very serious things, so we know these can, can happen. Fortunately, you know, we, our number one risk on the shuttle is getting hit by space junk. That is our number one risk to our life. Is, and we're just, you know, hoping that it doesn't happen. And the Orion won't have as much of a risk because it's a smaller, because we're smaller, we don't have as much of a risk of getting hit. Yes, ma'am. That, that kind of feeds into my question. What are your thoughts on rich people who pay to go up in space? I mean, it sounds dangerous without a lot of training. Yeah, Richard Garriott just landed a few days ago. Um, he had a very successful mission. Um, my, I guess I can just give you my opinion. I think it's great. Um, if you've got that much money, um, put it in the space program. Is, you know, if, if, that's, if a person's dream is to go into space and you, you have been very a very successful entrepreneur and I think he was the sixth or seventh, um, what we used to call space tourists, but now we call them space flight participants. Um, they actually, <laughs> they contract with the Russians and they get a launch on the Soyuz, they get 10 days in space and they return on the Soyuz. And it's been a very successful program and Russia can use the cash to keep their program going. Um, this, this space tourism is, with the Russians is gonna slow down because we're now gonna be launching more Europeans and Japanese and Americans on the Soyuz. But in the process of this, in the United States, small companies are building launch vehicles to take tourists into space. And instead of, now the Russians charge 30 million for that long 10 day mission. Yeah, it started at 20 million and it, inflation is you know taking over. But here in the United States in about two years, companies uh, like Burt Rutans, for example, will be able to take a citizen into space. $200,000 is what these people have signed up to pay to do about a 45-minute flight. And it will be suborbital. They will launch, <clears throat> and they'll see the stars at noon. They'll see the Earth's horizon, the, you know, the black sky. They'll undo their seatbelt. They'll get their floating in microgravity for about 45 minutes. They turn around and come back. So they're actually uh, progressing. They're building these uh, spacecraft. And I think it's great. I really do. Because the more they fly, the safer it'll get, the more the cost will come down, the more people will get a chance to go. So I think it's great. I wish it would just happen faster. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for being such a great audience. <laughs> You've been very patient. <laughs>